Hello, hello to everybody. Good morning and uh, welcome to our new webinar. Uh, while we wait that everybody is coming in, first of all, I'm glad to see you uh, that you are here again. My name is uh, Maria Vittoria Grassi and I'm talking to you from my company showroom based in Vicenza in Italy on the other side of the ocean for most of you. Um, I would like to briefly introduce uh, Giorgio Valentini. Uh, Giorgio, if you're here, tell hi. Hi, everybody. Good morning for the Americans. Good afternoon, the Europeans. And uh, he will lead the webinar in a few minutes. Uh, but the topic of today is dedicated to the history of theaters. And uh, for this event, we will host a friend of ours, uh, Aldo Cibic. Mr. Cibic is the renowned Italian designer, and he boasts a collaboration with Ettore uh, Sozzas, then later becoming a founding partner of the studio Sozzas Associati. He achieved remarkable projects in several fields as architecture, design, and design researches. Just to tell you, Domus Magazine introduced him as one of the 100 plus best architectural firms in 2019. Our collaboration with Mr. Cibic began in 2007 with Marmumac exhibition in Verona and this collaboration with my company Grassi Pietre and his unconventional use of natural stone and Vicenza stone in particular led us to get the communication award of that show. Um, if you're Aldo, if you just want to tell hello, and then, so he's the person who will lead the... Aldo, are you here? Yeah, he has to unmute himself. Yeah. If he's here or otherwise, he will just tell later on. Ecco me. Ecco me. Ciao, Aldo. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome to the webinar, Aldo. So, John, Welcome. If you want... Thank you. How do you see me better? Like this or like this? What do you say? It's okay. Do you see me? Yes, yes. That's I... eh? Okay. Perfect. So, you go. You if you want to take the lead right now, and then uh, we will go to. All right. Um, well, thank you, Maria Vittoria. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, you know participating. Uh, nice to see the typical old friends and uh, a lot of actually newcomers. Uh, um, we like always to start uh, so that you also get familiarized with the with the system. But you should have a, a chat uh, uh, box, I believe, is uh, below your screen, uh, where you can uh, post questions. And if you don't mind, just uh, texting where you're, uh, you know, logging in, and uh, you know, how's your weather over there? Um, here in New York City, it's a beautiful day, a little bit chilly. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about you. Um, that being said, while you are um, going through that, I will start uh, the, the presentation. Um, I'm a little bit rusted. I just came from Europe and a little bit jet lagged. So hopefully you uh, you pardon me for that. Um, so I will take you into uh, an overview of uh, the, probably the most famous theaters in the world. And we cannot, uh, of course, uh, avoid starting from La Scala, which is the main theater in Italy. And then uh, a little bit of the history of the theaters, uh, starting from the Greek and the Romans, and then uh, the our you know most prestigious and prominent figure in all this webinar, um, Mr. Palladio, which you know I believe has been the inspiration of Aldo Cibic in the renovation of uh, of the museum they did with Grassi Theater. So starting uh, La Scala, well, I mean, there's really not much to say on the, at the beginning of this, uh, the, you know, of this presentation is, uh, like I said, the most famous one uh, that we have in Italy it was erected, this actually inaugurated in 1778. And the few peculiarity, the season opened on December 7th, which is St. Ambrose, which is the patron of uh, Milan. And um, all performance uh, should end before midnight. Uh, I didn't even know that. Um, a, another interesting part is that uh, the logioni, which are uh, this uh, section here on top of the boxes, is the uh, area of the theater that was designated to the less affluent people. And they're typically the most aficionado, the fans, the tifosi, and uh, they don't really uh, hold back if the performance is not the best one. And um, one of the most important examples was in 2006, uh, uh, Roberto Alagna, when he was moved, uh, he left the performance in the middle of the AIDA. 
and uh, he had to be uh, replaced uh, by, by um, Antonello Palombi. That uh, he just jumped into the scene without even having the time to change his costume. That's to tell you how strong they are. Um, here is, you know, an idea of the performance. Most of the uh, um, of the La Scala's performance are based on Verdi. This is La Traviata, and um, you know, of course, there's many others. Coming into this part of the world, uh, we go to the Metropolitan Museum, primarily known as the Met. It um, was founded in 1883, so already 100 years uh, after La Scala. And originally it was built uh, in the, it was in the building on 39th and Broadway. Uh, it was moved to the Lincoln Center only in 1966. Um, it's the largest classical music organization in North America. Um, it, the typical season is 227 performance over 25 operas. Um, we could not ignore the ballet. Uh, the Broadway show uh, is all part of the, um, you know, of uh, what we are probably, you know, I hope uh, everybody's missing and that we can get back to that soon. And this is kind of the uh, pandemic that we have to go through. Here we are looking at the, the Globe Theatre in London. Uh, of course, uh, it was uh, is associated with the William Shakespeare. Um, the original one was built in 1599. Uh, the modern one uh, actually opened in 1997. Um, it's been, I think, the third time that this was built and the last one uh, was uh, destroyed by a fire. The very first one was destroyed by a fire. And of course, Romeo and Juliet and Nelly Shakespearean tragedy are performed in these theaters. Um, the Bolshoi Theaters uh, is probably the only theater in this um, uh, webinar that I haven't been through together with Palmyra that we'll see on every others. I've been through and in one of the others. So I'm happy to present it as a first-hand experience of all of them. Um, the Bolshoi is by far the world's biggest ballet company, it has more than 200 dancers. Um, so, of course, it's primarily ballet. And then the Sydney Opera House um, is one of the 20th century most famous and distinctive buildings um, in the harbor, in the Sydney Harbor, uh, is one of the most popular attractions in Australia. A lot of people just, um, you know, it's the first thing they go uh, when they go to Australia. And then, you know, Ennio Morricone, we lost him uh, just recently, and uh, he um, draw, actually wrote many, many performances. And uh, here we'll see a romantic mosaic from the first century before Christ, uh, uh, which actually is in Mosaic Capitolini, where you see the tragic uh, mask and the comic mask, uh, which are part of the, um, you know, two different phases of the, of the performances of the theater. But where is the, where did the theater start and how they were, um, uh, you know, the architecture of the theater? Well, there's three major parts um, of the theater of the time. Uh, the first one is the orchestra that you see is primarily around. And then we have the scene, and then the, uh, the, the we call it the coilon, which is the, you know, where the, um, spectators normally sits. Um, because of course the limitation of architecture and uh, the construction at the time, they tried to build the old, actually not all try, they did all their um, construction through hills and using the landscape uh, um, so that they could uh, first of all take advantage of the situation without erecting uh, too much. Um, and at the same time, it was an important part uh, um, to give a good acoustic um, to the um, to the to the ambience. Of course, there was not many you know instrument instruments like them, so the voice was the only thing that uh, could be broadcasted. Uh, but what is different from the theater nowadays is that um, what is uh, here the orchestra, which for now is considered a secondary part to the stage was actually the primary part of the performance. Um, the stage back then was not really a stage, but was more a backdrop for the different scenes um, where the different actors had to come in and out. Um, 
Um, also, over time, these gain more and more uh, importance, and that's why we see in today's theater where the scene is taking over and the orchestra is kind of hidden from the, uh, from the audience. Um, here is uh, the, one of the best examples of the Theater of Epidaurus. Um, it was built uh, uh, near Ligurio, which for many of you that are in the industry, in the stone industry, is actually a pretty important marble in a uh, Greek marble, uh, kind of a grayish, a brownish tone. Um, and uh, this is another example where you can see that the orchestra here has the primary uh, important, the primary stage. And what is would be today the actual stage is a little bit more on the background. Um, this theater was uh, constructed at the end of the fourth century before Christ, and it still has a great acoustics. I remember many years ago I was there on vacation, and um, you know after a full day of riding on a motorcycle, I fell asleep on the performance. But the acoustic was incredible. I gotta say that. Now, coming on the Italian side, um, this is the ancient theater of Taormina, and is very much used for many performances nowadays, too. Uh, this is, um, is a Roman theater, um, and the difference is mainly that the Romans start building with bricks, and they don't use as much the landscape as the Greek used to do. However, um, it was actually was believed to be built on the top of an existing big theater because uh, uh, keep most of those um, a way of uh, designing and building the architectures. And um, here is a drawing um, from the uh, Vitruvian architecture um, books uh, where uh, basically explain how the Romans changed the architecture and the design of the amphitheaters, moving the, uh, moving the scene uh, more toward the audience and how hiding the orchestra, it's kind of splitting the orchestra into, um, into sort of a backdrop. Uh, the other thing is the Roman gave a lot of importance to the um, to this event, and if you can see here in this map, uh, all these uh, little uh, um, town names have an amphitheater or a theater uh, that the Roman built. So it was a very, a very prominent part of uh, of their culture. Um, here is one of those examples, and you can see here also where it's already semicircular compared to the uh, circular uh, shape of the grid. Also, the backstage has become more and more prominent uh, with uh, pretty, you know, usually a two story high uh, building. Uh, the other important part, uh, the Roman, um, of course, had the much more elaborated architecture and knowledge of construction, and that's why they were able to build uh, such a higher buildings. And um, also being, as we see here, of course, the Colosseum, um, which is definitely much higher than the Greek theater that we saw before. Um, but also because being more of a military society, they kind of shift the importance to the culture, the performance, and the lyrics to the fight, the um, and the races, uh, you know, everything that has more military entertainment and more uh, um, strong performance. And um, that's why they built a higher stadium uh, to house more people, and also because the acoustic was not as important as it was in a theatrical performance. Here are uh, the different um, um, orders of the Colosseum, uh, starting from the Tuscan, the Ionic, and the two Corinthian at the top. Uh, on top of that, they also envision way how to cover so that it can be used uh, um, under different kinds of climate and circumstances. Um, last but not least, uh, um, in, in, we can see that uh, they go not only on the round, but a lot of circulars and the oval shapes that so gives more space for the performance of races and, uh, and fight. And one of the most examples that we all know, of course, is the arena in Verona. Uh, was built in the 30 um, after Christ, uh, on the site which was uh, outside the city walls and where are nowadays is the city center of, uh, for those of you that have been in Verona. And they were built from uh, white and pink limestone from the Valpolicella area. 
additional detail that I forgot to mention. Uh, all the Greek tend to use a lot of the local stone. Um, the Romans used uh, more of the brick and um, um, brick, brick materials for, for their uh, amphitheaters. Uh, this is a great shot of the arena uh, before COVID, of course. Uh, and um, again, for those of you that have been inside, you can see how well the performance and the acoustic is um, in, the, in these kind of settings. And unfortunately, this is the same situation nowadays. So things have changed uh, dramatically uh, with this COVID. Um, now, uh, getting back to um, more of uh, like I said, our um, our our uh, line of um, thoughts and and the discussion uh, Palladio uh, we see here the theater in Sardinia, which actually was not built by Palladio, drawn by Palladio. Palladio died a little bit earlier, um, but was done by one of his uh, most um, influenced. Um, uh, how you call it, the students, if you want to call it this way, Vicento Scamotti. Scamotti was actually also the, the art that the Finnish Palladio um, uh, start, um, Teatro Olimpico. Um, what we see here, and the importance of this uh, is that um, you can see that it was built in 15, between 1588 and 1590. So we already have a big gap between the uh, Greek and Roman um, construction and this all the uh, medieval time that goes in between. Um, and during the medieval time, first of all, there was kind of the dark age. It was not that much of importance to the culture and to leisure. But also the church was very much in power and was not much in favor of performances that had not much to do with um, with um, with gods and, and religions. Um, anyway, in Sabioneta was actually you know it's kind of a small town, but it's inside the Gonzaga Duke, uh, and um, they kind of want to build this uh, theater to give importance of the society and to you know show how civilized they were. And also, an important part of this, they actually built in one of the most important expensive real estate of the time. And uh, as a consequence of that, uh, um, Scamotti had to deal with uh, cramped spaces and narrow settings uh, um, that he wasn't uh, experiencing before. And this is uh, one of the challenges that he had to do, and also working more of a standing performance in this uh, horseshoe shape uh, um, that we don't see it in, uh, in, in other examples. Um, Teatro Farnese is also the uh, other theater together with the Olimpico and the one in Sabioneta, the only three that are still in existence today in uh, terms of the Renaissance uh, um, design. This is in Parma inside the Palazzo della Pelota. And here is uh, the first permanent uh, proscenium, which is actually a theater in which the audience views the actions through a single frame. And that's why they call it proscenium art, which is this art over here. Uh, a little, um, you know, candy. This is Teatrino Vetriano. Um, it's actually in Vetriano, it's a little uh, town up on the hills near Carrara. So again, for those of you that uh, go and inspect some marble, maybe spend half a day to visit this. Um, it's kind of a little uh, bonbonier or sweet box. Uh, it's a 71 square meter and only 85 seats. And in 1997, he reached the Guinness um, World of uh, the most, the, 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 short, the smallest public theater in the world. Um, this is another shot of the theaters. And uh, we'll finish, of course, with the Teatro Olimpico. Um, the first one is fired by Vitruvio and the Teatro Berga, which is uh, here are some drawings of the theaters. Um, there was a Roman theater in Vicenza. And um, here is what you will see of the Teatro Olimpico. Again, you can see that the um, orchestra is only half moon. And there's a lot of importance into the back. Um, last but not least, we'll see that the construction um, is a lot has a lot to do with the perspective, um, which 
change according to, to the scene. And, and according to Vitruvio, we'll see it in this drawing, um, the, back, the back scene has typically three types of scene. Uh, one is the tragic scene formed by column, pediment, statues, and other royal ornaments. And then we have the comic scene that shows more private houses, uh, windows, uh, similar to you know, ordinary dwelling. And the third one are more for the satirical scene that are typically depicted with trees, caves, rocks, and other rural objects uh, treated uh, with the more of a landscape style. Um, and here is the last uh, um, slide, uh, but I want to show you the um, typical example of the perspective that uh, uh, Peter really started before uh, the Renaissance. Uh, and uh, you know how this backdrop gained more and more importance in today's uh, perspective. I'm pretty much done with my part, so I'll be happy to uh, stop my sharing and leave it to Aldo um, to start uh, his side of the of the um, presentation. Aldo, if you want to take it over from here. Hello. Good evening, everybody, or good morning. I don't know who is seeing at our work. So I'm happy to show you the work that I we have made together with the, the Grassi company. It was a great work for us together. Is Teatro Ristori in Verona. This was done in uh, 2012. And I mean, basically the restoration was made of two parts. One, a contemporary one on the foyer, on the entrance, and a, a traditional restoration for the scene and all the platea. Um, we were, the desire from the beginning was to use a very mild material and that's why we have chosen to use the gray uh, Vicenza stone that Grassi is producing and uh, we have done a very sophisticated work in terms of all the details. Uh, I mean, where the stone is uh, touching, for example, here, the, uh, the ceiling with the, a very precise work of the reveals and a very precise work on how to put the banisters in glass. Uh, this is maybe the image that uh, gives a more general idea of the old foyer because there was this effect of the stairs that uh, they were a little like a, a Piranesi uh, architectural drawing showing this stair in stone going up and the other negative in wood going on the other, on the opposite way. And um, I mean, all the idea was on how to show a solid contemporary idea of an architecture, not a minimalistic or a too much expressionist, but the idea of an everlasting or even something that in, in the purpose was, was of something that was somehow already there. Uh, going to the next image, here you see again the detail of, of the, the banisters uh, in glass. Um, I don't know if was a, um, if I can go back one second to an image before. Uh, Susanna, we have the one that we see just from this side. 
Is over. I don't know. Let's check. Okay. Let's check. Here, yes. Here you see exactly the on the opposite side where we have the stair uh, that uh, is covering uh, and including the glass banister. We wanted to play on the contrast of the light blue color of the glass. We, did, we didn't want to use a very transparent glass, but use the glass that is more the blue effect to play on a soft combination of colors between the gray that we choose in a way not to have a, an homogeneous color, but to have different uh, rectangular pieces, the, the different stones, different one for the other for giving more an idea of the vibration of the material. The uh, glass and the plaster. Here, there is not stone. So this is more somehow the, the strange thing that the, 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 the foyer, the front architecture of the foyer was looking a lot like a house. So was how to find a balance between a scenographical effect in a box that actually was very traditional and some way very normal, almost banal. Here you see the old theater where we have rebuilt basically everything. We designed all the chairs. We uh, had a very heavy work of restoration because it was all wood before and we had to do all a metal structure. And then we have had incredible, uh, how do you say, decorators, the, the lady, the, 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 the the company making the wood finish and the decoration that was very, I mean, accurate and uh, playing with the, uh, I mean, very contemporary solution for the ceiling, having all the lighting system and uh, all all the plants to to give all the all the requirements for a contemporary theater. This room, anyway, uh, was. Uh, thought to be used for different events. So this uh, chair, this uh, armchair can be all removed to allow all different type of uh, events, show and uh, I mean, uh, opera or uh, um, music, etc. And this is the final image, which I love because of the chromatic effect of the curtain of the green curtain facing at the platea. And um, yeah, that's the last one. Um, going back to our uh, beginning and the relation with Grassi, I mean, uh, that is not the only one project we have done together. What uh, I I have always to thank Rassi for how they are taking care of the architect when they're working together in the execution and in understanding um, how to realize a sophisticated project. So more or less is all I have to say. Maria Victoria, it's a pleasure. Grazie so much. Thank you. As always, it's always nice to hear you here. Uh, yeah, me too. Very. It's well, always now, I, nice I tell to everybody what my brother told me, and he said the first time that we worked to together. You remember when we did uh, the first uh, show in Marmolac, you know? And he said to me, I still remember Aldo came to me and said, I want to do the ceiling made in stone there. And my brother said, listen, Aldo, whatever you want, but the stone doesn't fly and doesn't stay up. You have always brought the stone to the limit, you know? I, I, I always like that you, that you want to make the stone as, uh, bring it to the limit. And that's why you, you still remember the Louvre that we made together, you know? It's, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and nice. we won the prize. We won the first prize that time. Yeah, we won the first prize and I still remember. Yeah. In the Marmomac together with Kengo Kuma. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I still remember okay. that. And it was a nice, a nice time. Yeah. And the thing that I have to regret is even that you were not able to come here to see our showroom. You know, you have to. I come tomorrow, okay? Whenever you want. We are not so far. So, so. yeah. Sorry <laughs> to for this one. So, thank so. you so much. It was a pleasure. Mm. Thank I you. Thank you for your time and for being here with us. We know you're extremely busy. So. Enjoy. I'm leaving to China this week. So, <laughs> long travel. <laughs> Back to my normal life. Ah, thanks. Okay. I, I thank Anne Niniar that she may was doing the compliments. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, there's a few comments. They say the lovely detail work, Aldo, and that's uh, from Mark. Uh, there, are, you know, uh, we just we just love to see what it's written here in the in the chat. We have people from all the world because uh, we have people from London, from Massachusetts, from Canada. Oh we have boy, Miami, New York, India also. Yeah, so India, I've seen India before. Yes. Yeah, it's nice. That's very, very nice. exciting. It's starting to reach out, right? so it's a yeah, good it's... thing. Yeah. Well, so, if somebody wants to open up the microphone, this is usually the time that we kind of uh, leave it to some questions. Uh, um... If there is any questions, we are here, so sure. It's a film. It's a film. I think you did, you yeah. did a great job, Aldo, describing it, so I think they don't have a lot of requests about that. Yeah, no problem. So. I'm here, if you like, I'm here, otherwise. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you to you. Uh, great. Giorgio, I think, well, thank you so much, Angela. Great presentation. Everybody's sending an amazing and beautiful presentation. I think more or less we're done. So thank you to everybody. And also thanks to Giacomo, which is in the back, but he is the one that is thinking about these kind of things. So let's see each other in three weeks, more or less from now. And uh, we will see what comes out on this one. Beautiful, so, looking forward to Thank you so much and keep in touch. Grazie. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Timothy.